the forces of motion uh, section is called momentum. This is a mathematically complex topic and uh, very straightforward, um, but it is more mathematically complex than those that have gone before it, okay? So if we look at momentum, we'll look at what the equation for momentum is. Impulse, okay? Um, impulse rate of change of momentum divided by time, we'll look at that. Conservation of momentum, so this is how, this is the law or the principle of conservation of momentum. Elastic and elastic collisions. We don't need to go into this in a lot of detail. We don't need to go into um, elastic collisions and a half mv squared. We don't need to go into that level of detail. But we do need to be aware of the, of the energy implications of elastic and elastic collisions. And a car safety example. We'll do a car safety example. There are many examples. But um, the first three elements are really important. And this last one here, uh, you might be asked this in a variety of contexts, but car safety is quite an obvious one. So we'll get started then with the equation for momentum. So momentum. Momentum equals mass times velocity. Now because um, mass is measured in kilograms and velocity is measured in meters per second, momentum doesn't have its own unit like newtons. It's measured in kilogram meters per second okay so it is it is derived from mass and velocity so that's momentum and we often write it like this okay momentum is mass times velocity you must remember it really is important to remember the unit is kilogram meters per second now impulse is another equation you really need to know okay so that one is force equals change in momentum divided by time, okay, or change in time. So F equals a change in momentum divided by a change in time, and that's force. Or we could say, we could rearrange this and say, momentum, this is impulse, momentum or change in momentum equals, if we put this to the side, it would be force times time, okay? Obviously, force is measured in newtons, change in momentum is kilogram meters per second, and time is seconds, okay? So momentum equals force times time, or force is rate of change of momentum, or change of momentum divided by time. Very important, that really is very important in order to understand anything about momentum. Now, the next thing we, we need to look at is the principle of conservation of momentum. And all that means is, whatever the momentum is before, the momentum will be the same after a collision. And there are lots and lots and lots of examples of this. Explosions, uh, recoil in guns, um, or collisions of balls. Um, so we'll, we'll do a simple example with some balls just to illustrate the point um, of the principle of conservation of momentum. So for example, if we had two balls, different masses, okay? So we'll say we've got ball A, which is say five kilograms. And we'll say it's traveling at eight meters per second. And it collides into another ball. And we'll say this ball is, say, two kilograms. But this ball is stationary. This ball is not moving anywhere. So we say, well, after the collision, the five kilogram ball is now traveling at say, I don't know, three meters per second. Actually, no, I'll, I'll make it different. I'll make it slightly different. Make it six meters per second. And um, we've got this two kilogram ball. And we could say, well, tell me then, how fast is the two kilogram ball going? Okay? Now, this is very straightforward. The principle of conservation of momentum says the momentum before is the momentum after. So what's the momentum before? The momentum of this ball here, mass, 
times velocity is 40 kilogram meters per second. This one has no velocity, therefore it's stationary. Okay, so it's got no momentum. So this is 40 kilogram meters per second. And the principle of conserv conservation of momentum says it must be the same afterwards. So after the collision, we've still got 40 kilogram meters per second of momentum. Now this ball, the first ball, let's have a look how much he's got now. 5 times 6 is 30. So if we had 40, and now this one's taken, it's gone down to 30, it must have lost 10. So this one must have 10 kilogram meters per second of momentum. Because we started with 40 at the top. Then after the collision, this one went down to 30, so this one's now got 10. And because we know the equation, momentum is mass times velocity, we know it's got 10. 10 equals 2V, so V equals 10 over 2, which is 5 metres per second. So this ball now is travelling at 5 metres per second because it's got 10 kilogram metres per second of momentum. 10 plus 30 is the 40 you started with. There are lots, that's a very simplistic example to be honest, but there are other examples, sort of gun recoil. So you could have a gun uh, and the gun would fire a bullet and you would need to know the mass of the bullet, the mass of the gun. And if you knew, for example, that the bullet had a mass of say 0.05 kilograms and its velocity was 100 meters per second, you would know what its momentum was, so you could say its momentum is mass times velocity, which is 0.05 times 100, which equals 5 kilogram meters per second. So the momentum going forwards with the bullet would be uh, 5, which means that the gun itself must recoil with minus 5. This must have minus 5 kilogram meters per second of momentum because this. The momentum before the bullet was fired was zero. But once the bullet is fired, the principle of conservation of momentum states that the momentum will still be zero. And because momentum is a vector, if this one goes forwards with five kilogram meters per second, the gun itself must go back with minus five. Now if our gun, for example, had a mass of say two kilograms, that's a heavy gun actually, but two, uh, two kilograms. We could say, we could calculate how fast or the, the initial velocity that the gun will recoil at because we would say the momentum is mass times the velocity of the gun now. So it's five equals two V. V equals five over two, which is minus 2.5 meters per second. So this is why guns recoil because you have conservation momentum in one direction must be uh, balanced in the other direction. Okay? Right, the next one. Um, the definition of elastic and elastic collisions, this is quite straightforward. So when we have um, a collision and we have momentum transferred in one example to the other. So when we look at the example I used of these balls, you don't need to go into this much detail, but if you were to do a half mv squared and work out the kinetic energy here, you'd come out with a value and you could work out the kinetic energy here and you could work out the kinetic energy here. And what you'd notice is that whilst momentum is conserved, Kinetic energy is not. So that means the collision is inelastic. It's not elastic because kinetic energy is not conserved. Some of the energy has been lost. Momentum hasn't, but energy has. Some of it's gone down. Whereas in some collisions, which are called elastic collisions, that's where the kinetic energy is conserved after the collision. So with an elastic collision, the kinetic energy is conserved. You will have the same amount of kinetic energy before and after. You could, if you wanted to, calculate this 
by doing a half mv squared before and a half mv squared of the things afterwards. And you would notice, in this case, it is an inelastic collision. Okay? And the last one, which is very important, it really is very important, is this car safety example. It really is very important. So if we look at this equation, we know F equals change in momentum divided by change in time. Now, on change in momentum is force times time. And this is sometimes called impulse. So, if we think about this, if a car or a person is travelling with uh, a velocity, they have momentum, and if you crash, then you need to have a force acting on you in the opposite direction in order to bring your velocity to zero. Now, and that's what happens in a crash. So, in order to make this force as small as possible so as to save life and prevent injury, we need to make collisions last as long as possible. So by making the time for which a collision occurs longer, we can reduce the force required. So if we think about this, if, um, if a child was to fall off a swing, and the child, like we all did in playgrounds, the child is falling, and if we think about it, so the child's falling, and they've got momentum. So say they've fallen at 10 meters per second, and we could say they've got, I don't know, a mass of say 40 kilograms. We could say their momentum is 40 times 10 is 400. Now then, kilogram meters per second, obviously. Now, if they were to hit the ground, if they stopped in a hundredth of a second, let's have a look what that means. So if that momentum was to be absorbed, to stop in a hundredth of a second, let's see what force we'd need. So that equals F times a hundredth of a second. So the force would equal 400 divided by 0 0.01. And that would equal 4 with 4 zeros. That would be 40,000 newtons. Now 40,000 newtons would cause serious damage, all right? So by making the collision last longer, by making it last, say you could make it last for a tenth of a second or half a second. Let's see how different it would be if we make it last half a second. So if we could prolong the collision and make it last half a second instead, it would be force times a half. The force would then be 400 divided by a half, which is now 800 newtons instead of 40,000 newtons. So by making the time for a collision last longer, you are reducing the force, and thereby you're gonna save people's lives and prevent injury. So in the case of a car, the car has lots and lots and lots of things in it which are gonna preserve life. So, if we think about the passenger, so we have someone in the car, and the car is traveling with a velocity and suddenly it stops, it crashes. Now when it crashes, we need to make sure that the occupant or occupants are saved and that the force acting on them is never great enough to cause serious harm. So there are several procedures or safety uh, procedures in place. The first one is, this part of the car here is called a crumple zone. So your crumple zone, is designed to completely flatten. So what it does is, it absorbs lots and lots and lots and lots of energy, it crumples the front of the car, that means, rather than the car just stopping, it means that the car crumples at the front, thereby the collision lasts longer. Other things which will happen is, in modern cars, an airbag will come out. The airbag, again, when you hit the airbag, the airbag is prolonging the collision, thereby reducing the force acting on you. Other things you might have are seatbelts. So you've got your seatbelt. Now seatbelts, you and I, when we pull seatbelts, they seem to be fixed and rigid. Well, in a collision, they're not. They're, they're rather elastic. So what they do is they stretch and catch you slowly and therefore 
they reduce the overall force acting on you by making it last longer. So your momentum, the force required to stop you, is reduced and therefore prevents injury by making it last longer. And examples of this are things like crumple zones, airbags, seat belts, and in playgrounds it might be um, cushion bark or grass or anything. Like in a safety helmet it might have um, sponge inside. Everything is about making collisions last longer and therefore reducing that force which acts on you.